Our scripture reading this morning is found in Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 through 10. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house, and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. This is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Do you ever feel abandoned by God? Have you ever felt abandoned by God? Maybe you tried really hard. You're like, I want to honor the Lord with my life. I want to do the best that I can. I want to live according to scripture. And then out of the blue, bam, some hardship or trial comes and you're like, God, where are you? This is the place that Joseph easily could have found himself. Now let's just kind of take a step back because we, uh, last week we were referring to Judah and Tamar. That was a pretty crazy passage of things that were going on. And this one seems like it's shaping up to be another one that's like that. But let's see where we're at and where, what's Joseph experiencing right now in his life. If you remember, I think we might have the side of Joseph's family tree, what's going on in his family. Remember, his dad's a deceiver. He's got brothers that have done some crazy things. They've murdered. They've committed adultery. We know that his brothers hated his gut so much that they wanted to kill him. And then it seems like at the last minute he was saved from being killed. He was then thrown into a pit, and then his brothers sold him into slavery. And so he was sold, as we learn at the, at the end of chapter 37, he ends up, he just happens to end up in Potiphar's house, the captain of the guard. So Joseph, at the time when he's 17, 18 years old, his mother has died, his brother sold him into slavery, he's in a nation where they are godless. They actually worship Pharaoh. They worship other gods. There's no one he's going to run into that happens to be a believer at his workplace, as it were. But think about it. He's like 17 or 18 years old when this happens. This is the place that he finds himself in, away from family. The dreams that he had about the future seem to have been lost. He could easily have been in the place of saying, where is God? And you might have experienced, you might be feeling that right now. You might find yourself in a situation that you're like, how did I get here? 
But you might also be in a situation where you're like, I know how I got here. I'm here because I've made mistakes. I've sinned. But God wants you to know something. This passage, though, though oftentimes it is preached as, how do I avoid temptation? This passage, this chapter is about this. God is present in times of prosperity and in times of adversity. That's the main point of this passage. So whether you find yourself now or sometime in the future in difficult situations, whether you find yourself in that situation because you've made mistakes or you find yourself in situations where you're, you're there because other people have sinned or disappointment has come unexpectedly, we need to know that God is present in times of prosperity and in times of adversity. He's present in times when you're going to face great temptations, as we see here in this passage. Just to summarize what Dwayne read, we know that Joseph finds himself in Potiphar's house. So he's the officer of the guard. He he's has a significant role in a nation that is probably the most dominant nation at the time in the world. Joseph just happens to be in that household. And even though he's away from everybody that he knows, look what it says in verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Actually, the phrase the Lord happens eight times in this chapter because God wants us to know he is present in times of prosperity. He's present in in times of adversity. That's the thing that sticks out the most. God is present. You're going to hear me say that again and again, because in the midst of the fog of pain and trial, we, we just see the pain in the trial. But we want to see God here, because if we see God here, you can see God in the midst of your life. You can see God in the midst of the person that you love who's walking through trial. You can be an encouragement to them. The Bible says, commit your way to the Lord in Psalm 37, trust in him and he will act. Joseph actually is experiencing the fruit of that. He's committed his way to the Lord. He's trusting in him and he's seeing God act because he's choosing to live righteously, which is inviting God's Favor, look at verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of the Egyptian, of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. He's got like the Midas touch, like everything he puts his hands on seems to be blessed. So Joseph found favor in the sight, in his sight, and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. We have to understand the significance of what's going on here. Here is a young man. Even in this chapter, we don't know how long he was in Potiphar's house, how long it took for Potiphar to notice him. We know that between now and when Joseph finally gets out of prison, it's about 10, 12 years. So, you know, he's... He's somewhere around 20, 22 probably. It's just a guess. And he's in charge of the household of the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Because as he's been faithful, God's hand of blessing comes. Living righteously often brings God's favor. As we choose to live our lives in accordance with how God has created this world to function, in accordance with God's command, blessing does come. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is a false gospel. The prosperity gospel says Jesus died on the cross so that you could have a comfortable life here and have lots of stuff. That blessing comes. All you have to do is name it, claim it. It is yours. The Bible does not teach that at all. 
fact, the call to follow Jesus is a call to take up your cross and follow him. The call to follow Jesus is one of sacrifice and one in which we are going to suffer like Christ suffered. But there is a reality, and I've seen this time and again, as Christians commit their way to the Lord and trust in him, they see God's favor just come. Why? Because we are the aroma of Christ to God, to those who are being saved and to those who are perishing. They notice something about us. They notice something that's different. You can expect that God's hand will be present, even sometimes when you're like, I don't really get it. And we should be aware of it, that it's God's hand. We shouldn't take credit for it. We shouldn't think that we're something special because Joseph didn't have God's hand of favor because he was something special. He had God's hand of favor because God was something special. But then we also see, though God's favor comes when we live righteously, we also see that living righteously often means we experience overwhelming temptation. Living righteously often means we experience overwhelming temptation. Now look back at your Bibles. We see the temptation that comes. Now it comes in, in part because God, God made Joseph look pretty pretty sharp. Look what it says here at the end of verse 6. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Joseph was on the cover of Egypt's GQ magazine. He totally was. I mean, you don't see this about just like everybody in scripture. Like he's handsome in form and appearance. He's a young 20-something guy that's probably ripped and he knows how to manage stuff. He's confident. He's kind and gracious because he trusts in his God. There's something about him that's just attractive and he's actually attractive. And his boss's wife notices. Her husband's aging. You know, he's probably hard to look at. I mean, he's the captain of the guard. He probably doesn't have all his teeth. We don't know anything about Potiphar. It doesn't say anything about him. But she's attracted to him, and she's pretty straightforward in her proposal of what she's saying. In fact, it's not even a proposal. Just It says, after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. There's no subtlety there. This is not someone who's trying to woo somebody. No, she's just straight up. We have to understand, like, she's in a place of authority. She's the wife of the head of the house. She's used to getting her way. She knows that a slave is going to probably take advantage of, of an opportunity. And Joseph's faced with that reality. I mean, come on, he's been through some hard stuff. His family has sold him into slavery. He's probably been beaten somewhere along the way. His brothers ripped his clothes off because they were so jealous of him. I mean, why not give in to temptation? I mean, just, I deserve a little bit. I mean, no one's going to see. That's, that temptation had to be real for Joseph. Like, we can look at him and be like, well, he's different than us. No, he's just like us, he's flesh and blood. He would have experienced that overwhelming temptation that was there. But look how Joseph responds. He says, he refuses, and he says, behold, because, because of me, my master has no concern about anything. The master, he's, he's given him in charge. I can't dishonor the master. So he has respect, he has integrity. But here's the bigger thing. Look at the end of verse 9. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph understands the root of the temptation. Because Joseph actually isn't, he's not running from temptation. He's actually been running to God. He, the first thing that comes to his mind is not, how am I going to get out of this? The first thing is, no, like I have a God who has been faithful to me. Joseph is reminded of the reality that he should be dead right now. I mean, really, he should be dead. His brothers wanted to murder him. He was thrown into a pit and survived that one. He was sold into slavery he could easily have been sold to anyone to be used and abused, but he's not. He sees his God's 
faithfulness and he's entrusting himself to God. So his first response is the overflow of what's in his heart. His heart has an affection towards God. Even in the midst of hardship and overwhelming circumstance, why is his affection that way? Well, some way, somehow, he cultivated that affection before God. That is why we, we encourage like gathering with the saints and spending time in God's word so we can cultivate that affection for God. So when temptation comes, it's not about running from the temptation, it's about running to God. But as we'll see here, like he's going to have to run from some temptation. Ah. He's going to have to run from temptation because we look back at the passage. Because Joseph says in verse 10, he doesn't want to sin against God and he spoke to... And she spoke to Joseph day after day, day after day. This wasn't a one-time occurrence. Do you ever feel that way with the things that tempt you? Maybe it's a struggle with sin that you had in your past and it just seems to come up. And then it comes up the next day and it comes up the next day and it just feels like it beats you down. Joseph's experiencing that. God is present in the midst of the hardship of temptation. God's not the one that's tempting him. James 1.14 says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Like temptation comes not because, because God's like trying to tempt us. No, he doesn't tempt anyone. It's when we have affections in our heart that have been pricked and it, it pulls us. And so it's real. We just need to acknowledge the reality that temptation is real. And look how it, it continues to come at Joseph. Look at verse 11. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, he's just trying to do his job. And none of the men of the house was there in the house. No one else is there. No one is going to see. I mean, why not? I mean, he's been through a lot. I mean, she's just, she just won't give in. Why not just give in a little bit? I mean, it's the master's wife. I mean, come on, why, why not? I, I deserve this. Do you ever feel that? Do you ever feel like when temptation comes, it's right there, it just gets you, gets you? I just, I, it's been hard. You know, I've done enough, Lord. I just should have a little bit of pleasure, a little bit of, of giving into that. Friends, temptation often comes when no one else is around. Because the enemy knows that's when we're weak. And I was having a conversation with some friends recently about how, how being alone with things that tempt you is so much more prevalent in our day because of these things. Whether they're on your desk or you put them on your lap or you have it in your pocket. I'm not that old. Some of you may think so, but I'm not that old. And... When I was young, you had to work hard to be alone in situations like this. To look at inappropriate images, you had to go into the drugstore and buy inappropriate magazines or, or, find, or steal it or something like that. You had to physically go to places to find yourself alone with the temptation to sin. Not that that didn't occur, but like you really had to work for it. We don't have to work for it now. Like what Joseph is experiencing, uh, we experience every single day. Every single day. And so we, and, and I say that because we should not tempt, take temptation lightly. We shouldn't slough it off. Yes, this passage is ultimately about the fact that God is present in the midst of prosperity and in the midst of adversity. But when this adversity comes, sometimes we do need to flee. Look what Joseph does. So she comes to him again and again, 
everybody's gone, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And I don't know what this looks like. I mean, he wasn't wearing jeans with belts and stuff like that. His clothes were probably like wrapped around him because that's how it worked. You know, he couldn't go to the buckle to buy some clothes that would stay tight on him. Okay. We just have to understand that. And she just, he's doing his job. He's working in the garden. We don't know what he's doing. She just comes after him, grabs his clothes, and he's so focused on God, he just runs. Sometimes we just need to run. Sometimes that's just the right thing that we need to do is run. Like I'd encourage you to have in your contacts, in your phone, the top three to five people you know that you can run to. Like make it as easy as possible that you just boom and you can hit the phone and you can call. Maybe the temptation is you're just ready to go off on your kids. You, sometimes you need to call that the brother or sister and say, I, the temptation is knocking at the door for me. Maybe the bottle is calling you again because you keep, you keep running to it rather than running away from it. You need to call somebody. Sometimes we just need to run. It's helpful that we have people that we can run to. It's helpful that we have a body of believers that understands that temptation is real and we need, we need our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to humble ourselves with our brothers and sisters in Christ and come and say, look, this temptation is real. I got my own Potiphar's wife. She keeps coming at me, knocking at my door every single day. I just need you to know that. Because when I come running, I need you to give me some clothes because I might have to leave them at the door. I don't think any of us are physically going to have to leave our clothes at the door, but you understand, like the heart issue that's there. Listen, God's kindness is this. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says this. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But when the tempt with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's just an awareness that God's present. Like even when the temptation is just right there, ready to just rip at you. God is present. God is pre Your God is present there to deliver you. Be, be more aware of his presence than you are about what is it that I need to do to get out of this. Be aware he is present because he loves you and he cares for you. Now, friends, I want to be clear. Yes, it's appropriate and helpful for us to have boundaries and to put things on our devices so that we can't go certain places so that we don't end up alone. And if you don't know how to do that, wait after church. I can show you how to do it. It's super easy. All you have to do is be able to read a couple of instructions and you can get your phone in a place where you're not going to be alone. Even when you're with alone with it, you won't be alone with it. Even though those are helpful, none of that can stop you from sinning. There's nothing that we do that, that achieves like sinlessness. No, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Where are the affections of your heart? What are you focusing your attention on? Are you renewing your mind? Maybe spend some time this afternoon in Colossians chapter 3 and read through that. Set your mind on things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. As we renew our minds, it, it arms us for the day of temptation. Okay. That there is application for temptation, but be aware this is about God being present. So God is present, even though a sham happens. I'm just going to read through what happens next in the passage. Just look back at your Bibles. As soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to, me, to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. So she, she crafts a narrative. I don't know if this... I hope this hasn't happened to you, but maybe it has happened to you where 
where someone takes true details about situations and they craft it in such a way to make you look like the bad guy. If she's even super, she grabs people and she gets it. These people, they're under her authority. They have to do what she says. She realize, they realize if she, if she wants to, she can throw me under the bus too. So they jump on the bandwagon and she's a drama queen because she completely, you know, has the narrative. She keeps his cloak. Look what, she, look what it says. And then she laid up his garment by her until the master came home and she told him the same story. The Hebrew servant who you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left the garment beside me and fled outside the house. So you could get the image. Like Potiphar comes home. He sees Joseph's clothes laying next to his wife. It is true. She has Joseph's clothes. She sets the stage in deception. Only to have this happen. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined and he was there in prison. Like, you're like, come on! Even as you read the story, even if you yourself aren't immediately identifying with it happening in your life, you're just like, this should not happen. Joseph did the right thing. What is going on? He did absolutely the right thing. And it went wrong. He did absolutely the right thing. And he was lied about false accusation and hardship because living righteously does not prevent you from false accusation or hardship. Like our life as Christians isn't if I do the right things, then all the right things will happen to me. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is I, I'm aware of what Christ has done. And no matter what befalls me, I know he will be there. As we sang, it is well, it is well with my soul. You can trust God is going to be present during times of adversity. And you're like, hey, hey, uh, Jamie, like, come on, he's in prison again. I I'm in that place. You've got your own prison maybe that you have experienced, maybe that you're experiencing now. Maybe some of you in the future, that's going to come because the longer you live your life, problems come. They, they do. You're like, what? Like, how, how do I see God in the midst of this? Don't miss the detail that Potiphar is the captain of the guard. The prisoners from, Potiphar, from, from Pharaoh's house go to the prison that he, he ultimately oversees. The man was flipping angry. Uh, he knew how to kill people. I assure you he knew how to kill people. I assure you that no one would have batted an eye if a Hebrew slave, because the Hebrews, they were thought of as less than slaves. As we'll learn later, the Egyptians didn't even want to eat with Joseph's brothers because they didn't want to be at the same table because they thought so low of them. All Potiphar had to do was just take off Joseph's head and he could have been done with it. And no one would have questioned it. But even in the midst of that darkness, God is there. God is there. Have you ever felt like God's not there in the midst of the darkness? in the midst of what just seems like so wrong. Maybe some boss that you've had has said things about you that you're like, I am just trying to do my best. Why does my review keep beating me down? Why did that subordinate go around my authority to go and speak to the authorities and say, say things that were true but twist them so that I just look like the scapegoat and I'm the one that got the ax? I don't know what your situation is or could potentially be, but we need to know that God is there. 
And we are reassured by the author of this book that God is there. Look back at your Bibles. So after he's thrown into prison, look at what it says in verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. Boy, that steadfast love that's talked about, it's like immovable, unchangeable, rock solid love. He shows him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Even though he hits like literal rock bottom, it doesn't seem like he's there long. Remember, he's still in his 20s somewhere. We don't know exactly where. He's still in his 20s somewhere. And God brings him favor. You know, it's, it's more of a modern thing for us to value youth the way that we do. Often in previous cultures and in previous days, they valued older people. They valued the gray hair. But yet Joseph in his youth is valued. Why? Because God was so much with Joseph that even the unbelievers, the pagans, saw that God was with him. And then the, look what happens. The keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. All of them. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it to succeed. He, the keeper of the prison paid no attention The keeper of the prison would have definitely been under a significant weight of responsibility. The nefarious characters or the, the people that were there, so there probably were people in the jail that uh, maybe wanted to kill Pharaoh at some point in time, would have done bad things, or other times they just had fallen, uh, you know, someone else had lied about them. So there were probably kind of innocent people in the prison too. He's in charge of making sure they stay there, making sure they get what they're supposed to get, and he just walks away. He goes to plays video games with his bros. Like, he doesn't have to pay attention to it at all. Why? Because there is a man who is so trustworthy, he trusts him to take care of the bad people. That should blow our minds. Brothers and sisters, in the midst of your hardship that you experience, God is there. God is present. If you can't see it, I know that those who are in your small group, those that you know, they can see it and they're going to point it out to you so that you can see that, you, that God is present in times of prosperity and in times of adversity. We need to know that God fights for us because in the midst of this, sometimes we don't see that God's fighting for us. Deuteronomy 3.22 says, You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. It's the Lord your God who fights for you. As we walk with God, he is present. You might be familiar, familiar with a song or poem called Footprints in the Sand, in which the individual is aware of two sets of footprints walking in the sand during times of prosperity, but during a time of adversity, there's only one set of footprints. And so the individual asks God about it and says, how come you abandoned me when I was suffering? And God replies, my son, my precious child, I love you and I would never leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Friends, just so you know, like, that's not in the Bible. I know there are pictures of it in the Christian bookstore and everything. It, it is not in the Bible. But it does give us an image of things that are. Because Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Honestly, I, I, there's nothing wrong having that quote because it reminds us of things. But I kind of think like if there were two footprints in the sand, all of a sudden one of the footprints doesn't get depressed near as much into the sand. Because the burden isn't as hard because someone else is carrying it. His name is Jesus. We have to remember that. The Lord fights for us. We should expect adversity 
to come because in the scriptures, actually, adversity is often a sign of blessing. I know that's counterintuitive. You're like, hard things are good. Jesus said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Friends, when hardship comes, we can rejoice. We're not masochists. We're not like, oh, I just love when bad things happen to me. No, when they come, no, it's an opportunity for you, for your life to give glory to God. Because when the world experiences hardship, they lash out, they blame, they become victims, they, 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 they get angry, they become vindictive, they go on missions that we're going to get ours. But we entrust ourselves to the Lord because we remember in adversity that Christ is with us. And even as we are in the Old Testament and Jesus' name isn't pointed to, we must see Jesus here in this passage. Because Joseph's life is pointing to Jesus. In fact, it's magnifying Jesus because Joseph, Joseph had a rightful place, right? He was the favored son. And yet, his brothers throw him into slavery. He finds himself in prison. He didn't willingly go there, but he had to go there. Jesus willingly left his rightful place to be obedient to his father, to come and live among us. He became average. Joseph, he's handsome in appearance. That's not what it says about Jesus. This is what it says about Jesus in Isaiah 53. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. So when you look at Joseph and you're like, yeah, but he was a good looking guy. Joseph's not your hero. Jesus is. Joseph was tempted by one woman to have a shortcut to power. Jesus was tempted by the devil himself. So that you could be found in his family so that he could be the perfect spotless lamb. Joseph was falsely accused. Jesus was silent and falsely accused. Joseph was forsaken by his family. But understand this, Joseph was never forsaken by his God. But Jesus was. Jesus was forsaken, not because of something that he did. Jesus was forsaken because of something that we did. Why did Jesus on the cross say, Father, why have you forsaken me? The answer is, is because of me. The answer is I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. You're accepted because he was condemned. We are alive and well and the spirit dwells within us because he died and rose again. That is what is true. That is what this is ultimately pointing us to. Have you responded to the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't just focus on the trials and tribulations and difficulties that you're experiencing. I think God uses those things to get our attention because he wants us to see he is present. He wants our hearts. And if we have trusted in Jesus, this is true. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Because of what Christ has done, no matter what comes your way, temptation, trial, prosperity, God is with you. God is present in times of prosperity and in times of adversity. And we need look no farther than the cross of Christ to know that he is for us and that he loves us even when our circumstances scream at us and try to tell us something that's different. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you right now, saints, I want to encourage you right now to settle your heart and engage with God right where you're at. Engage with the Lord. It's easy for us to start with the things we want to ask help for or the things we're burdened by, but let's start simply by asking or simply by thanking God that he's provided the way of escape. Just thank God for where you're at that he's provided a way of escape. Thank God maybe for that brother or sister in Christ that you know that you can call, that one who was there for you this week in small group. Just thank God for them. Thank God that they're in the room today that before you leave, you are, you're aware of the burden that you have. You have someone that you can talk to. Just thank God where you're at. Now it's appropriate for us in light of seeing this temptation that came at Joseph that, that there, are, there are temptations that are coming our way and, and maybe... Maybe you've given in to something. Maybe there's something you need to ask for forgiveness for as I know I had to ask forgiveness this week to a friend because I, I had sinned and needed to ask for forgiveness. Just come before God right now and confess that sin. The enemy wants you to, to think about you and your failure. God wants you to come and confess that so you can experience forgiveness and an awareness of his nearness. So just come before him right now if there's a burden on your heart and confess it to the Lord. And then just ask God, God, help me to see Jesus. Ask God, help me to see you. I want you more. I want to taste and see that you are good so that the affections of your heart would be driven to be in his presence where you'll find it easier to flee because you are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Just ask God for that. I know he wants to grant that to you. He wants to grant that to all of us. Just ask God for his help. And Father, we yield to you. In the midst of difficulty, or as much as we don't want, as much as we just want it to be different, Lord, we yield to your will for our life. As we walk through what's in front of us, we know that you are beside us. We yield to your providence in the midst of pain, and we know that you are with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we pray together.